everyone. Welcome to Brown Bag History for April 14th, 2021. As we start, we will acknowledge the land, traditions, and culture of four nations, the Equipment, the Tanaha, the Snipes, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. So today I'm talking about the, the Columbia River, and that's a huge topic. So I've just chosen a few aspects of the river and a few stories to focus on today. Uh, to start off with, it's really important to acknowledge the historic use of the Columbia River and its tributaries by Indigenous people. Uh, throughout the, the course of the, the entire river, there are several nations who uh, have traditionally inhabited and uh, accessed the river and used the river, lived on the river. And um, the, the nation that historically had uh, village sites and uh, hunting and fishing sites on this part of the Columbia River and the Arrow Lakes and down into uh, the Colville region or the uh, Kettle Falls region of Washington state was the Sinaiics nation. And um, many of the topics that I'm touching on today, I have dealt with in a lot greater length in uh, other talks. So I won't be talking too much about the Sinaiics today, but we do have an exhibit in the museum and a lot of resources uh, to learn more about uh, the Sinaiics. Uh, it's especially to note, uh, important to note that they did have traditional lands here. Uh, for years, we really didn't talk about the indigenous use of this land. Uh, the kind of general uh, line was that they didn't really live here. They didn't, they didn't like the mountains or the snow, but we know that that's just not true. There was a village site in Big Eddy and throughout the, what's now referred to as Revelstoke Reach and throughout the, the Arrow Lakes region. And uh, they did have significant use of this land for centuries. And uh, their territory is spoken about as between Revelstoke and Kettle Falls, but we know that they that they did uh, that they were north of Revelstoke as well. The territory north of Revelstoke is a little less defined. We also know that the Sequepmac was in this area uh, quite a bit, particularly in the hunting and gathering season in the fall. This was a sketch um, that I'm showing right now of a the Nike's man who uh, was uh, encountered by the artist Paul Kane, who came across with a fur trading group at, in 19, 1847. And he encountered this man near Downey Creek, north of Revelstoke. The, the, the Columbia River was uh, the uh, mouth of the Columbia River was seen by an explorer uh, for the first time in the 17, uh, 1700s. In uh, 1792, Captain Robert Gray, who was a trader from Boston, was in search of sea otter furs, and he sailed into the mouth of the river. He named it Columbia after his ship, which was called Columbia Red Aviva, or Columbus Reborn. After several attempts, he finally navigated into the mouth of the river and spent nine days there trading for furs with the First Nations in that area. But it wasn't for quite a, a long time after that, that people discovered the whole extent of the river. And the river starts in a trickling up from the ground at Canal Flats, uh, which is south of, uh, of Invermere. It's um, uh, 1,936 kilometers long with the first 744 kilometers in Canada. It begins on the west side of the Rocky Mountains at bubbling up at Canal Flats and rises in Columbia Lake. And at its uh, natural state, it flowed north, northwest uh, through the Rocky Mountain Trench for uh, 304 kilometers, then made a hairpin bend around the, the north end of the Selkirk Range, and then went south to the Big Eddy, and from there continued south, passing through the upper and lower Arrow Lakes before crossing into the United States and eventually coming out at Astoria, Oregon. So this map um, shows the what's referred to as the big bend of the, the Columbia River. And that's there that where I said it flowed north 
And then at the top of this map, where uh, on, you might be able to see the point uh, 99, which is, uh, th this was sort of the mileage map uh, for the uh, Big Bend Highway. But at 99 was the point known as, as both encampment. And uh, you can see, so the line of the original uh, map, uh, there were several uh, points where there were rapids throughout there as well, uh, particularly uh, Death Rapids and uh, Priest Rapids, and then uh, closer to Rebel Stoke Steamboat Rapids and Little Dallas Canyon. And uh, so it was very much a wild, free flowing river then before all the dams were built. The, the first European explorer uh, to navigate the entire Columbia River and to create maps of this region was uh, David Thompson. And this is another case where I've done a whole talk on David Thompson and I'm just gonna really gloss over his work in this talk. But he um, came over at the Basco Pass in January, 1811, establishing boat encampment. He'd originally started his exploration of the Columbia River in uh, 1806 and had uh, descended Blaybury River from Rocky Mountain House uh, to the Columbia River. But at that time, he didn't realize it was the Columbia because it was flowing north at that point. So he was doing a lot of exploration in the lower part of the river and in, over into the Kootenai River and then down into the, uh, the United States along the Kootenai River. And uh, it wasn't in, in uh, the fall of 1810, he wanted to do more exploration on the river, but um, was in a dispute with the Pagan Indians because of uh, trading that he was doing in the, with the Tanaha. And uh, so he um, made a decision to uh, go from Jasper over the Athabasca Pass and uh, eventually get to the Columbia that way. So they set off uh, from Jasper on December 29th and uh, headed, started heading over the Athabasca Pass. He had a group of people with him, including a man named Thomas, who is a, an Iroquois guide. And um, you can just imagine what a horrendous trip it was. I think the, the men were hungry and soaked to the skin, uh, wading through ridiculous amounts of snow. And then in uh, Thompson's journal on January 7th, 1811, he says, I saw the track of a large animal it has uh, four large toes, about three or four inches long and a small nail at the end of each. The ball of his foot sank about three inches deeper than his toes. The hinder part of his foot did not mark well. The hole is about 14 inches long by eight inches wide and very much resembles a large bear's track, it was on the rivulet in about six inches of snow. But it, the, some of the men with him were actually speculating that it could have been a mammoth. They can imagine how terrifying that would have been. He said, one man has asserted that his grandfather told him he saw one of those animals in a mountain pass where he was hunting, and that on hearing its roar, which he compared to loud thunder, the sight almost left his eyes and his heart became as small as an infant. He later said, I never appeared to give credence to these reports, for they appeared to rise from that fondness of the, for the marvelous so common to mankind. The sight of the track of that large beast staggered me, and I often thought of it, yet never could bring myself to believe such an animal existed, but thought it might be the track of some monster bear. So finally, they, uh, following the Wood River, they reached the forks of the Columbian Canoe Rivers on uh, January 18th, 1811. They pressed on up the Columbia until the 23rd, but the going was too hard. So they returned to the River Conjunction, which Thompson named Boat Encampment. They'd only traveled 12 miles in four days. So they made the decision to winter at uh, Boat Encampment. And Thompson said, our residence was near the junction of two rivers from the mountains with the Columbia. The upper stream, which forms the defile by which we came to the Columbia, I named Flatheart from the men being dispirited. The other was the Canoe River. The Flatheart was, was later known as the Wood River. So their hut was, uh, and their hut was somewhere between the mouths of, of the rivers. 
they were hunting for food and uh, searching for su suitable sea route from which to build a canoe. They weren't able to uh, get bark that was good enough to build a, a cedar bark canoe. So they built uh, with just with the uh, axe available to them, they cut cedar planks and made a what was referred to as a clinker built uh, canoe with overlapping boards. It was 25 feet long and 42 inches uh, 42 inches wide and sharp at both ends. They uh, sewed it together with moose hide twine. So they finally set out on April 17th, 1811, upriver to the mouth of the Blayberry Creek. And uh, at that point, they were traveling through entirely new country and uh, still deep snow and uh, no wild uh, game to, to be caught. But they finally made it, um, crossed over to the Kootenai and then met up to the Columbia again continued down to Astoria, Oregon, and reached there July 15th, 1811. And um, they were, um, at that point, they were building Fort, uh, people were building Fort Astoria. So they returned to Kettle Falls and started heading northwards back up to Bowdoin encampment. Uh, he passed by uh, present day uh, Revelstoke on September 11th, 1811 and then encountered the canyon just north of Revelstoke, what was referred to for years as the Little Dells. Uh, he said it was a very dangerous rapid where the water falls nine feet over two large stones to pass which took all our united strength, two in the boat guiding her and seven on the line. I carried all my articles lest evil should over overtake them. This night from exertion, I can hardly write. But they finally um, got to, uh, through the canyon, got through the Death Rapids or Dal de Mort, and returned to Bowdoin encampment on September 18th. And at that point, he had navigated the entire Columbia River and created maps of the river based on his travels. After that time, the uh, Columbia River uh, became a major fur trading route in the, this part of the, the country and uh, continued so until about the 1850s. Um, another um, person who was in this region as a, a fur trader in the early days was a man named Ross Cox, who was born in Ireland in 1783 and worked for the J.J. Astor's American Fur Company. And um, he was quite involved in the fur trade in the region. He uh, published a uh, book called Adventures on the Columbia River in 1831. And in that book was a story that happened in 1817. So there was a, a group of uh, fur traders who had uh, reached both encampment coming upriver from uh, the United States, and reached both encampment on May 27th, 1817. And it was determined that seven men of the group were too weak to make the trip across Athabasca Pass and they were ordered, ordered to go back. It was felt that they could arrive safely at Kettle Falls in three days. So they were given three days provisions. They made it to the Upper Dells or uh, Death Rapids and disembarked. They tied a line to the canoe's stern and used poles to keep it from the rocks. But halfway down, the canoe caught a current, were swirled around and the line snapped. The canoe was engulfed and smashed and the provisions had been left in the canoe. So they lost, lost all their boat and they lost their provisions. And there they were stranded in the wilderness. So they started trying to walk southward. But um, in, in Ross Cox's uh, re uh, recollections or in his book, he said, on the third day, poor Macron died and the surviving comrades divided his remains in equal parts between them on which they subsisted for some days. So they started to cannibalize each other as they died. And more of the men died as they continued down. And finally, only two men, Lapierre and Dubois, remained alive. And uh, finally, Lapierre alone was found on the Upper Air Lake by two Sinaix men, and they took him down to Kettle Falls. Lapierre said that uh, he had begun to be suspicious of Dubois, and one night he uh, pretended that he was asleep. He observed Dubois cautiously opening his clasp knife in the act of trying to cut his throat. But um, Lapierre stated that he managed to get the, the knife from Dubois and in self-defense cut Dubois' throat. 
and but later remains of uh, two other members of the party were found and with indications of murder. So Lapierre was sent east to trial with the one Sennax man going as a witness. But the testimony was circumstantial, so Lapierre was acquitted. And uh, it was said that there were crosses erected at both encampment and at Arrowhead. And there was some very old cross that was still in Arrowhead in the when the when it was settled as a community. Could have been that one. But there was another story that took place on the Columbia River in uh, in the in the 1830s. Uh, two um, priests were uh, sent into this region uh, to proselytize the indigenous people and. Um, I must say that you know, the way that, that their orders were written were certainly um, very racist against indigenous people and against indigenous spiritual beliefs. But that was you know, that, that was what they were being sent to do was to proselytize the the indigenous people and to also bring back into the fold any uh, lapsed um, Europeans that they encountered as well. But on uh, their trip down, they were at uh, went got as far as both encampment, and there weren't as the number of boats required to take the whole party down. So they got the the priests down as far as uh, as um, probably near a present day Arrowhead, and then sent a boat back up for the rest of the people. And uh, but it really wasn't sufficient. There were uh, 26 people in this in this boat, so it was overcrowded and it was over full with their um, with their belongings and their their goods, um, and they got as far as uh, Death Rapids, and uh, they all went ashore with only a portion of the baggage. The boat uh, started, struck a rock, failed, was brought and was brought onto shore. Uh, they emptied and reloaded, but the fur packages left in the bottom had gotten wet, rendering the boat a lot heavier. So the the passengers got back in um, not very comfortably and they got to the next rapid which we believe to be priest rapids and at that point the boat filled up again and um, the pilot was telling everybody to remain still but it was a young man named Mr. Wallace who was a, an English botanist who was coming out into the region and he panicked he uh, pulled off his coat stood up put one side one foot on the side of the boat and leaped into the water with his young wife, who was actually a daughter of uh, the Hudson Bay um, Governor uh, Simpson. The boat lost its balance and uh, upset, and the 26 people were thrown into the water, and 12 of them lost their lives, including several children who were coming out with their families. And the, the, some of them, the people managed to reach the shore. Others were saved on the keel of the boat, but uh, that happened in the, the dusk of, an e of the evening. So it was a you know, terrible tragedy. And uh, the boat with the remaining people managed to make it down to boat to um, where the priests were near Arrowhead and um, were able to tell them what had happened. Um, I think they, they had only three bodies of um, uh, three children that they were able to recover. And we believe that those were buried near Arrowhead. So that you know that these are just a couple of many many tragedies that have happened on the river over the years. The fur trade uh, continued until the 1850s, and then there was gold found uh, throughout the region in uh, the 1860s. And so between 1960. Or 1865 and 1866, particularly, there was uh, quite a gold rush that occurred, and it was centered on most of the creeks going up Downey Creek, Carnes Creek. Those are actually named after some of the, the early prospectors that uh, first discovered gold in those areas. And then Gold Stream and French Creek, which flows into Gold Stream, that was kind of the, the height of, of uh, where the uh, gold uh, rush was taking place. So there were probably thousands of men who flooded into the area during that time and um, managed to take out amounts of, of gold. But uh, it was very difficult to get into the region. You could either come up from the States walking or 
in boats. Uh, there was actually a, a small steamboat that was built in Washington State to come up into the area and uh, taking bringing people up. And then there were also trails from the um, from the uh, Chushuap Lake, Seymour Arm area, over to the Columbia River. So people, uh, they were coming from Canada. They were traveling that way to get into the over onto the river. Uh, the gold rush was really short lived, uh, but in that time, they figured that there was uh, at least there was three million dollars in 1865 dollars uh, worth of gold taken out of the region. That was what was officially reported. And of course, there's been mining in that region since there, but uh, nothing to that extent. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, the bridges uh, now at, at Revelstoke. Of course, the first bridge across the, the river, well, the very first bridge was a very short-lived toll bridge that was that I didn't put a picture up today. That um, crossed probably close to where the Big Eddy Bridge goes across, and it was just for, used for moving goods from one side to, to the other, but uh, it, it didn't last very long. And then the CPR bridge was completed in October of 1885. And of course it's been replaced uh, several times over the years as well. In uh, 1910, the first traffic bridge was completed across the Columbia River and it crossed the river one block south of the current Big Eddy Bridge. It was a wooden structure. Um, really only in use for about 15 years or so until they built the uh, what we all know now as the, the Big Eddy Traffic Bridge. And it was completed in 1924. Um, this is a really great photograph that we have in our collection. It's a long panorama photo and it shows the three bridges. So in the, in the back foreground, you can see the original 1910 traffic bridge. And then in the middle, there's the 1924 traffic bridge that's still there now, the Big Eddy Bridge that we are, is still in use. And then the uh, CPR bridge. This picture was probably taken about 1925. Now I came across this really great story and uh, found this photograph that I'm pretty sure is about this event. And you can see tons of people on the, the, the Big Eddy Bridge. And I uh, did a little bit of research in the newspaper and I found a story about a man named Krikor Hekimin, who was originally from Armenia, who was going around North America doing these um, feats of, of you know, physical you know, fitness or you know, real you know, physical feats. Um, one of the things that he liked to do was pull trucks and automobiles with his teeth. So he was definitely kind of a daredevil kind of a guy. His nickname was the human seal. So uh, one of the things that he liked to do was swim across rivers that people normally didn't swim across. And he especially liked to, uh, to, to swim in icy water. Uh, one of the things that he did was um, he had broken the ice of a lake in Ontario and swam in minus 48 uh, degrees Celsius weather. Uh, he also jumped off the top of the Patello Bridge in New Westminster. He swam the Fraser River there. And then he also swam the Fraser River at Lytton. He claimed that was one of his toughest swims because of the whirlpools. Uh, he said he didn't drink or smoke or eat candies and said that his main diet was garlic. He said the best route to good health was to go to the river every morning before breakfast and take a plunge. So he planned to do a, a swim across the Columbia River at Revelstoke on October 17th in under, two, under 10 minutes. He also wanted to jump from the center of the bridge, but uh, he wasn't able to get permission to do that. And he also offered a prize of $25 to anyone who could uh, beat him across the river. So on, uh, on October 17th, the newspaper reported that there was probably up to 1,500 people on hand to witness his swim. He started from the East Bank and made the long swim in four and a half minutes. Uh, he didn't make the dive, saying that the authorities didn't allow it. 
Uh, he did have one person who really wanted to take up his $25 challenge and swim with them. That was a young man named Johnny Jones, who was the Rotary Club's lifeguard at Williamson's Lake. But um, he still lived at home and his parents wouldn't allow it because they didn't have a safety boat or anything uh, present. Uh, Hakimian tried again to swim the Columbia River in early August of 1938, but he was unsuccessful probably due to the higher water. He started from the West Bank this time, but was carried, carried rapidly downstream as soon as he reached the midstream current and whirlpools. He began calling for help and Bob Blackmore put out from shore near the wing dam, just in time to intercept the swimmer before he struck the eddies and undercurrent. Uh, this is Blackmore, Bob Blackmore in the front of this photograph. He was a well-known uh, lumberman and riverboat man in this region for many, many years. You may have heard the talk that I did on the adventure uh, from the book Down the Columbia, which was a, a trip down the Columbia River in 1920. And Bob Blackmore was their guide between uh, Golden and, um, and Revelstoke. So he knew the, the river really, really well. Um, he actually, uh, sometime in the, the 1930s, he went, uh, was out in his, in his boat and went missing and was uh, presumed drowned. But for many years, he was, he was definitely one of the premier boatmen in the, the river. These were the boat houses that, uh, uh, where Bob Blackmore and uh, others kept their boats just off from uh, Front Street. And uh, in that uh, account about Hakimi, and it mentioned the wing dam. The wing dam is still there. It was built um, in the probably late 1890s or early 1900s to create a breakwater. Uh, to stop erosion on the riverbank at, uh, at Front Street. And at low water, you can still see the, the rocks out into the, into the river that was referred to as the wing dam. Um, I think I've also mentioned in some of my previous talks a, an accident that happened at that uh, point in 1920. The other person in this photograph, the man on the, the left, was Walter Nelson. He was just about around 20 years old, was a duly returned soldier. And uh, he had taken three young women out for a boat ride and uh, when the, the water was quite high and uh, was trying to get go over the little ripple just at the end of the wing dam, but the boat hit the end of the dam and overturned and uh, all four of them drowned. So this is some um, photograph when the um, Trans Canada Highway Bridge was under construction. It was uh, completed in 1962, a year before the Trans Canada was completed through Rogers Pass, but it was definitely it was part of that that construction. And uh, you can see here the the railway tracks heading up into the area. And you can also see that there were several little, little farmhouses in that area. So where Woodenhead Park and the a &W are now, there were, there were farms and all through that area and the other side of the, the bridge as well. Here's another picture of the, the bridge under construction. We've got actually quite a few photos, photographs of the bridge construction. And there's the uh, opening ceremony on July 26, 1961 with uh, Premier W.A.C. Bennett. A lot of people don't realize that the Columbia River used to freeze quite often. And uh, so here's a picture of people skating on the river just north of the, the bridge in the 1890s. But another aspect to the, the river freezing over was ice harvest. There were a lot of uh, people that were harvesting ice from the, the Columbia River and uh, they have ice axes and cut big blocks of ice. So they would, the CPR had a a big ice house here. And there were also several of the farms that had ice houses where they would store ice in sawdust uh, throughout the year. We'll talk a little bit about some of the steamboats that operated on the river. And again, this has been another full talk. And in fact, I've given full talks on some of the individual boats as well. But um, this is the uh, SS Lytton that was uh, built in um, 1890 for use in this region. And it uh, traveled 
as uh, far north as Downey Creek. That was really as far as the steamboats could navigate. They really, it was too difficult to navigate the rapids uh, north of Downey Creek, Death Rapids and Priest Rapids. Uh, but they had trouble with some of the other rapids too, like Revelstoke Canyon. There is one account that one of the early trips of the SS Lytton in the uh, 1890s, but I think it was possibly about 1894. It took them six hours to line the boat out up through the, the, the Revelstoke Canyon Rapids. Uh, and this is just below where the, the dam is now. Uh, but it was really treacherous rapids. And in, especially in the early season in the high water, it was very difficult to, to get boats through there. So they had people on the riverbank with uh, ropes lining the boat up. So it took them six hours to get out there. And on the return trip, it took them six minutes to get through the same stretch of water. Uh, these are a uh, picture of the SS Revelstoke in the, can in the canyon. The Revelstoke was built by a consortium of local businessmen in 1902, and it operated on the Columbia River until 1915, when it was uh, burned in a big mill fire at Comiflex. The, uh, Boat at the Revelstoke was tied up there for the winter and uh, was burned in that in that arson fire as well. Uh, but it uh, spent a lot of time going up and down the river. Um, we even have pictures of it with huge amounts of people on it, taking them to parties at Hall's Landing or St. Leon Hot Springs. But it was they made you good use of that boat for sure. Um, this is the SS Trail, Rossland and Minto at Arrowhead around 1899. Um, where Arrowhead is the point uh, about 24 miles south of Revelstoke where the Columbia River widened into the upper Arrow Lake and then narrowed again and then widened again into the lower Arrow Lake which continued on to Castlegar. But it was a lot easier for the boats to navigate the lakes than it was for them to navigate the river. So the CPR built a branch line between Revelstoke and Arrowhead in 1895 and uh, then had a fleet of ships operating from there down as far as West Robson, which is now Castlegar. And uh, so that enabled them to open up the river traffic as part of their, their, their uh, rail traffic as well. It just continued the transportation link. So um, the uh, Minto was the longest running boat on the Arrow Lake system. It, uh, was launched in November of 1898, and uh, it continued operate in operation until 1954, when it had its last run. Uh, there was um, a, a farmer at uh, Galena Bay that tried to save the, the Minto, and uh, he really wanted to get it back into service, but he wasn't able to do that, and it was still lying on the beach at the time that they um, BC Hydro was wanting to clear the, the valley for the flooding of the Hukimli side dam. So it was hauled into the mid, middle of the, the river and set on fire. And that was the, the end of the Minto. Uh, they also had um, the ferries operating on the river. The, there was a highway between Revelstoke and Arrowhead that opened, I believe, in the 1920s. And there were two ferry crossings. The river uh, or the road went on this side of the river as far as 12 mile and then crossed over in a, in the ferry. And at low water, you can still see the the uh, the, the ramp area where the, the uh, boat went across. And uh, then it, the road continued on the west side down as far as Sidmouth and then crossed again up the 24 mile ferry. And then there was a, a road into to Arrowhead from there. And then another ferry that would take people across the northeast arm to Beaton, and then uh, other roads into the Trout Lake area. And then this was the MV Lardo, which operated between uh, Arrowhead and uh, Macusk for man many years after the, the Minto was put out of service. And it wasn't until the uh, 19, uh, early 1970s that the current Highway 23 South was, uh, was put in. I also wanted to talk a little bit about flooding on the river. There were two major recorded floods. Uh, a lot of 
there was a lot of years where there were flooding as well, but the two major ones were 1894 and 1948, and uh, they were flood years throughout the province and throughout the region. The 1894 flood at the beginning of June it also affected the Fraser River. Um, and this uh, farmhouse that we're looking at in this picture was the home of the Fraser family. And they had settled there in 1886 and had really one of the first established farms in the area. Uh, you can see it's you know, very, there's a lot of trees that they had to clear in order to, to get the farm into to work in, work in order and to have acreage uh, cleared for planting. Uh, but uh, during the flood of 1894, uh, Fraser had five acres of farmland submerged and it came into his house. So he actually ended up raising his entire house by three feet. He had his family move into a neighbor's house while the flood was in effect. He also removed uh, his uh, cattle, pigs and poultry to a neighboring, neighboring farm. He lost a small amount of produce or of, uh, of his um, livestock, uh, a few chickens and ducks, but was able to save most of them. But he did lose over an acre, half an acre of strawberries and 130 fruit trees. The wharf at Revelstoke was underwater during the 1894 flood, and uh, a new bridge that had just been built over the Yellow Silhouette was taken out by heavy logs. Uh, the riverbank was being undermined. The river was two feet above the previous high water mark. Many people on Front Street lost land and outbuildings. There was a note in one of the newspapers saying that um, F.B. Wells, who had the post office and men's clothing store in Front Street, lost his water closet or outdoor toilet when it was uh, swept into the water. And as it was floating away, they could see a, a rooster owned by Mr. Kirkup on the top. And the rooster finally uh, realized that he could fly and was able to fly back to safety. In the uh, 1890, in the 1948 flood, uh, it was really a devastating flood throughout the whole interior of uh, BC and uh, Washington State as well. There were several people who died in Washington State, but uh, the river rose steadily up until June 9th. Uh, a lot of farms in the Big Eddy were evacuated. Uh, water covered the loop road south of Revelstoke and parts of the Arrowhead to Revelstoke Road. 25 farms at Mount Karshi were affected and uh, many of them had to leave their farms in rafts just to get out of the, the flood zone. So many of the crops were completely ruined at many of the farms there and also at Sidmouth farther south. As we uh, said the arrowhead to Revelstoke bus was stalled in water between the 12 mile and Sidmouth ferries and took a, a, a team of horses to pull the vehicle out. The river also took out part of the road leading to the garbage dump, which is where Centennial Park is now, or the, the banks along Centennial Park. Uh, the water coursed through the trees and uh, jammed them, uh, almost isolating the McKinnon Dairy Farm, which was just down below where Danny Street Sawmills is now. Uh, Mrs. McKinnon was forced to evacuate her stock and some of her equipment. And, um, the, the river peak was just below the 1894 mark on the railway bridge. Much of the province was hard hit, uh, including the Kootenays and the Fraser Valley. Uh, Chilliwack was particularly impacted. Uh, there was um, a BC flood emergency fund set up. So the, the flooding, particularly the 1948 flood was one of the, the impetus was behind the negotiation of the, the Columbia River Treaty. It uh, completely devastated the, the city of Vanport in Oregon. And um, along with the growing power demand in the Pacific Northwest, they were really looking at ways to harness the, the, the particularly the Columbia River and to use it for flood control and irrigation and for power generation as well. Um, in uh, exchange for providing flood control and for an equal share of the incremental U.S. downstream power benefits, Canada agreed to build three dams, the Duncan, and uh, the uh, Hugh Kinley side at uh, Castlegar, and the Mica Dam, and uh, then also allowed the U.S. to build the Libby Dam, which flooded into Canada as well. Uh, 
So it's uh, not that this is another topic you know, that deserves its, its own talk. So I won't get into too much detail about it right now. Uh, the treaty was negotiated in 1961 and ratified in 1964. And that really laid the uh, uh, foundation for the building of the, the dams that we have on the river now. The Revelstoke was an additional dam that wasn't part of the original treaty. Um, but the uh, Hukin Leaside Dam uh, they started construction uh, right after the uh, treaty was, uh, was ratified. And it was completed in 1968 and officially opened in June of 1969. Uh, they built uh, locks into the dam so that people can pass through. Uh, was actually able to get permission to go on the dam a couple of years ago when we were doing uh, some filming and uh, were able to see people going through the locks. And we also saw a load of uh, logs being let through from the, uh, the, the pulp mill that operates in that area. Uh, this actually, the two people there, the one up against the, uh, the wall is uh, Claire Dibble, who was, uh, she paddled the entire Columbia River uh, in uh, 2019. And uh, different people were uh, accompanying her for part of the way. Uh, this is a man that came up from the United States uh, with his uh, Sinaix man with his own sturgeon nose canoe and paddled with Claire for part of the journey. And um, it was, it's really interesting seeing the locks operate. The water goes down a long, long way to let them out on the other side. But the big impact of the Hugh Kamey side down was the, the flooding that really occurred all the way up the upper and lower Arrow Lakes and all the way from Arrowhead up to Revelstoke and uh, impacted land all the way through. This picture of the Mount Carchet settlement taken from the mountain in the 1920s shows uh, the farmland there. And uh, it was just tremendous amount of, of farms that were impacted, um, tremendous numbers of people that had to uh, be relocated. In the whole uh, Arrow Lakes Reservoir, there were approximately 2,000 people who were displaced from their homes. And uh, many of them didn't feel that they got adequate compensation. So it was, um, and even you know, more than 50 years later, there's still bitterness about how it was, how it was done. And, people having to leave their, their rural lives that they were very attached to and be living off the land. And um, so it, was, it, it had a huge impact uh, both on the people and on the landscape as well. So this narrow wild Columbia River that was there no longer exists. It impacted right up to Revelstoke. It was in the, uh, the McKinnon family had to uh, closed down their dairy and they moved some of their buildings across the Columbia River uh, to there's some of them are still uh, up on Nickel Road, their old log house. The uh, airport had to be rebuilt. This is the, the rebuilt airport in uh, 1970. The um, uh, Centennial Park had to be uh, rebuilt. They had to raise it by about four feet, otherwise we would have lost the ballparks in the community as well. And there was uh, that's when the, you know, the dikes were built in the Big Eddy and uh, on the Yellow Silhouette to uh, mitigate the impacts of the, the Hukim Side Dam. So it had a huge impact on this region. You know, there's a lot of people who come in in recent years and go down onto the flats and don't really have an understanding of what that land was and how it was used previous to the construction of the dam and just the impact that that had. Um, I came here in 1978, and one of the things that I remember was uh, putting my clothes out on the, the line and then starting to see clouds of dust moving up the valley from the south, and then having to run out and grab the laundry and bring it in before the dust uh, got into town. Uh, they have since planted grasses in the valley that have uh, stopped the, those huge dust storms, but it used to be really bad. Uh, it just, you, you couldn't see for, the, for dust in town and you go out afterwards, your car was completely coated in dust. You could feel a grit in your teeth. I'd have to close all the windows in your house. So uh, you know, there's, been, there's been lots of impacts uh, over the years. 
Um, again, I'm not going to talk too much about Micah Dam, but um, they, I actually found a newspaper article last week in 1951 when they were already talking about uh, damming the Columbia River at Micah. So it had been in the planning stages for a long time, even before the uh, treaty was uh, ratified. Um, there was even this bit of a side note here, but uh, there was a lot of concern about uh, BC really possibly really losing out in the deal because most of the negotiation was really done at the federal level. And uh, there was a, a few people that were actually proposing that the Columbia River be diverted to the Fraser and not flow into the United States at all. So, you know, there was a, there was a lot of pushback to the, the treaty as well. Uh, but again, here you can see uh, the, the proposed site of the Mica Dam. And it was under construction for, for several years and uh, finally was uh, completed in 1973. Of course, there was a quite a big uh, community that developed there, all the, the workers and their families that were living there. They had a little school and little stores and a lot of their own little, own services there too. And the Revelstoke Canyon Dam uh, started construction in the, the 1970s and was completed in uh, 1983. And it was built just above the Revelstoke Canyon. Uh, this is uh, preparation for the site in 1979. Uh, I know there's still people in town that uh, worked on the dam and I'm sure they, they have a lot of stories. That's another story that we need to pursue a little bit more, make sure we've captured that history. And of course, that had a a huge impact on the community of Revelstoke because it was so close and people were moving into here. So that was one of the real boom cycles in Revelstoke and a lot of, uh, of uh, houses were built at that time, uh, trailer parks were opened at that time. Uh, a lot of people came into the area and some chose to stay even after the dam construction was completed. There's a picture of the construction of the powerhouse and of course, the uh, the dam had a huge impact on uh, the river. The Mica Dam had created the Kinbasket Reservoir, and uh, the, had really obliterated the former site of uh, both encampment. And the uh, uh, Revelstoke Dam obliterated that wild river uh, north of Revelstoke and uh, turned it into what's now Lake Res Revelstoke, the reservoir above the dam. So I've just got a few pictures here showing what the, uh, the valley looked like prior to the building of the dam. And we've talked about the rapids and you know how much of a wild river it was. A little picture showing a little bridge just uh, through the, the canyon. And uh, the Big Bend Highway that was completed in 1940 that followed the bend of the highway. And uh, Silvertip Falls, just eight miles north of Revelstoke, which was a really popular picnic spot. So that's uh, what we're, you know, what I've got to talk about today. Uh, the uh, Columbia River Treaty is currently on re under review. It had no end date, but either country could uh, unilaterally terminate the treaty from September 2024 onwards, provided that at least 10 years notice is given. So there's a lot of uh, discussions now uh, between the, the government and uh, you know, finally, they've actually included the indigenous people who live or, on the river and have interest in the river into the negotiations as well, which is a big step forward. There is uh, ways to uh, be involved in the in public engagement process of the treaty review. Uh, the gov if you either ju just even just Google Columbia River Treaty Review, it'll probably it'll take you to this page, or uh, engage.gov.bc.ca Columbia River Treaty, and uh, find more information about it. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, the next talk is scheduled for Wednesday, April 28th, and I'll be talking a little bit more in depth about the Mount Karshia community at that time. Thanks for coming today.